Hello, and thank you for being here today. My name is Pamela Fullerton, and I'll introduce myself a little bit more in the next slide. But I wanted to tell you about what our presentation is going to be today, College Transition and Success, Moving from Stagnation to Success. It's a little bit of a tongue twister, but I promise everything else is going to be a lot clearer. I hope you really enjoyed today's presentation. College students, uh, especially ones that are non-traditional students or students that have transferred from a community college or a different college, you know, there's a lot of questions around how do I fit in, how do I belong, how do I transition, how do I be successful in this new community? So we're gonna be talking all about that today. And for those of you that are traditional students, you went right from college, right from high school to Columbia College in Chicago. There's going to be some great information for you as well. So I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. So before I start really talking a lot, I want you to get to know me a little bit. So as I said, my name is Pamela Fullerton. I am a licensed clinical professional counselor here in the state of Illinois. What that means is that I am a mental health professional. So I support a large range of individuals spanning from babies, as my youngest clients have actually been babies, to as old as a student who is 82 years old, a college student. And she said to me, Pam, I want to graduate before I die. And I went, that's a lot of pressure to put on me considering your age, but we're going to do it. And I'm happy to say that this student did graduate with her first college degree at 83 years old. So um, I am also, instead, and besides just being a counselor, um, I'm also an adjunct instructor at a four-year university here in Chicago. I am a PhD candidate at Governor State University, and I've taught at both the undergraduate and graduate levels, so I know college students very well. I myself have been a college student for over 20 years, and so I've got a lot of experience. I've got a lot of failures that I learned some really good lessons from, and I hope to provide you with all that information today. I always have objectives for my lessons. I want my students to know what we're going to be talking about, what I hope that they can get out of any of my lectures. So we're gonna talk about four main areas of college success. Advocacy, communication with college staff and faculty, college level reading and writing, and time management, and our favorite topic, procrastination. So advocacy. I always say it's an essential skill, not only for college, but also for life. One of my favorite quotes is by a psychologist. Her name is Dr. Susan Jeffers. And she says, feel the fear and do it anyway. Advocacy is fearful. Being a self-advocate, having to open your mouth and say what you need, what you want, that is very fearful because we never know who's gonna to respond to that. And we don't know what the person on the other end is going to say. They very well could say no. And we know that we are all very sensitive to rejection, right? And sometimes we avoid asking for what we want out of fear of rejection. But I want you to keep this quote in mind. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Self-advocacy is one of those skills that we all need, especially in college, because so many things happen to us during that time. We're not just going to classes. We are dealing with social environment and peers. We are dealing with academic rigor, right? Maybe difficult topics, difficult subjects. We are dealing with a life change going from one part of our life, maybe from high school or a different college to another part of our life. So we're making that transition. We are dealing with new relationships, which is also very difficult, whether it's with our faculty or professors or staff or new peers. And we still have maybe a job we're working, right, to, in order to help pay for college, or we are um, dealing with family. I mean, there are plenty of college students who are parents themselves. And if they're not parents, maybe they're helping to take care of their parents, right, or siblings or aunts and uncles. So we have to remember that we're not just college students. There's so much more to us, so much more involved in our life. So when we're talking about advocacy, I like to introduce this quote by a psychologist. Her name is Dr. Susan Jeffers. 
And, the, and she says, feel the fear and do it anyway. It is often very scary to ask for what we want and mainly because we're afraid of rejection. We don't know what the other person is going to say. We don't know if they're gonna say yes or no. We don't know if they're gonna ask us for something in return. And that fear sometimes keeps us from asking for what we want. My dad always said to me, Close, uh, closed mouths don't get fed. Right. So if we keep our mouths closed, we're not going to get what we need. And that's what advocacy is really all about. As a college student, you're dealing with more than just being a college student, more than just waking up and going to your classes and studying and taking tests. You're dealing with family obligations. You're dealing with life obligations. Many college students work these days in order to help pay bills, in order to help pay for their college um, experience. Um, people have other obligations outside of that, right? There are many um, parents who are going to college, like myself, I'm one of them, right? I have a family, I'm also trying to go to school and I'm also working. It takes a lot out of us. We can't do this job alone. Self-advocacy is knowing that, and that's a strength to know. I need help and I need to ask for it and I need to maybe ask different people for the different things that I need and not be afraid uh, and let fear stop us from possible rejection. All right, so that's what we're gonna talk about, self-advocacy. There are three different tools that I wanna share with you today on how to self-advocate. The first one is putting yourself in your education first. So I'm gonna have a quick story to tell you about this. I worked with a student once and uh, he came to my office because he was put on academic probation. So semester after semester, he was failing. And so he got his GPA down so low that the college was like, if you don't pull it up, we're dropping you out of the college. And so as I got to know this student, I was like, what's going on? You're, you, you, you clearly have great academic abilities. So there must be something else going on or why you're not passing. And I learned that his family who lived in another country constantly made him go back to his country of origin to attend weddings, funerals, other family obligations, because it was part of their culture to do that. And every family member, no matter where they were in the world, had to attend those events, or else it brought shame upon the family or the family looked bad. So him and I had to have a really hard conversation about values. He had this strong family value. On the other hand, he had this value to complete his education. And they were not working well together. They were bumping heads at every semester. So we talked about how do you respect the value of family, but also make sure you're completing your education. And we had to work something out with him. We role played how to talk to his family about the importance of him being in school and not leaving for a month at a time to do other obligations in his country of origin. And successful he was because he advocated for himself. He talked more to his teachers about what he needed and what was going on with him. And he talked more to his family about what he needed and what was going on with his classes. And he was able to finally graduate and move on to the next part of his life, right? So you have to put yourself in your education first, and sometimes it takes some negotiation to do that. Next, you need to find and use your resources on campus. This is such an important skill to have in terms of advocacy. I need to know what I have available to me that's free on my college campus, and I need to actually go and use it. Right, So every student is introduced to all the wonderful resources that Columbia College has. But the question is, do they then go use it? Are they using the Academic Tutoring Center? Are they using the TRIO Support Services? Are they using the Counseling and Psychological Center? Are they using the Career Development Center? Right, And all the many resources that, additional resources that Columbia has to offer. You have to find and use those resources. Next, we're going to talk about communication, right? So yes, we feel good. We're going to start self-advocating. We're going to ask for what we need. That's all wonderful. But how do I communicate that, right, to the people that are in my college campus? 
That's what we're going to talk about next. How do you reach out to staff and faculty? <laughs> so I found this really great um, newspaper cartoon about like a college, a common college experience. So you have a whole bunch of students raising their hands and you have the professors sitting up in front and here are the questions. And he says, any more questions? When is the first midterm? It's on the syllabus. Do you have an attendance policy? It's on the syllabus. When are your office hours? No more questions, just read the syllabus, right? So communication number one, you have to read your syllabus when you get them from your instructors. And they're all required to give you one. And if they're not, you definitely need to communicate with somebody about that, because that would be a major error. So first step in communication is, before I talk, let me make sure I know what I'm talking about. All the information you need is on that syllabus. I suggest you read it. I suggest you reread it. And then I suggest you write down questions so that when you come to class on your first day or your first two lectures, you ask those questions to make sure you get the answers to every question you have. You have the right to have your questions answered. But first, you need to have questions in order to get them answered, right? And you need to, again, remember what my dad said, closed mouths don't get fed. So open your mouth and ask for what you need and what you don't know. I have a wonderful acronym for you to remember, and I hope that this helps you with your communication. So the acronym is CEO, which is like, you know, the ultimate job, the big boss, right? So how do you become that big boss? Well, you're going to do three things. When you communicate, you're going to ask for clarification about things. That's why you communicate. Maybe you don't know something. Maybe you read the syllabus and didn't understand something. Maybe you want like a clarification about the last project that you're supposed to do or the last exam that you have, whatever the case may be. You communicate when you need clarification on something. Part two, the E, you communicate early. So I am an, an instructor at a university, as I told you when I introduced myself. And I can tell you the number of times Students come to me at the end of the semester to say, well, I'm not doing so well. What can I do to pass? It's kind of too late if you're coming to me at the end of the semester. However, the student who came to me early and said, you know, let's meet regularly. I'm going to come to your office hours regularly. I want to make sure that I do well in this class. That's the student who actually is going to do very well because they communicated early with me about their needs and how I can best support them. Classes haven't started yet, right? Columbia College starts in September. The college I work at starts at the end of August. I already have students emailing me for the fall asking me, hey, can you send me your syllabus early so I can prepare for things? That's how we know someone's going to be successful. They're preparing early and they're communicating early. And the last part of my acronym is called OFTEN. So yeah, that's great that you reached out to me in the first week of class, but if I never hear from you again, and then wait till the end of the semester again to reach out to me, there probably will be problems as well. So I like as an instructor, and I know most instructors like communication that's often. We should connect every couple of weeks. I also have two additional reminders in terms of communication. The first one is that it's really important to refer back to your syllabus to get information on how and when to best communicate with your staff and faculty. So that means you can find their office hours there, you can find their email, their office phone number, you know, there's usually a note about the best way to communicate with them and when. So that's a great way to get information. And then your, you know, website, your college website has all the other information. When is the tutoring center open? Monday through Sunday, this time to that time, you know, when is the counseling and psychological services office open? 
When is the services for students with disabilities office open? When is the TRIO office open, right? So having all that information so you know when to use it and how you use those services are very important. All right, are you all with me? Thumbs up? Nice, okay. So part three, college level reading and writing. Yes. College involves a lot of reading and <laughs> involves a lot of writing. It is something you can't get past. I don't care what your major is. You have to take certain classes. For example, English is required in nearly every single, if not every single major. So what are you gonna be doing? You're gonna be doing reading, you're gonna be doing writing, right? So since we can't remove that obstacle, I say, we have to love to learn it, right? And this is about embracing your education. You wanted to go to college. You decided that this was part of you getting to your ultimate goal, that ultimate career goal, right? And college and that college degree is kind of part of the journey. So you have to remember to embrace what you started this journey for, right? that why we always talk about that why factor that's what motivates us why do i want to do this why do i want to write 100 papers why do i want to do this internship for 900 hours why because we love what we're doing because it's going to get us to our goal and that is how we have to think about every single reading assignment and every single writing assignment now there are some practical steps that we can do as well to make sure that we get the most out of what we're doing with our reading and our writing assignments. One, um, and this is from um, Harvard University, did this very large study about what is most effective in the classroom for studying and learning. What is most effective, right? It's a three-step process. Step one is that you have to read and take notes before the class lecture. You have the syllabus, you know what you're gonna be talking about in class. So that required reading that comes beforehand, you have to do it and you have to take notes on it, right? Step two, while you're in that class lecture, you take additional notes, right? Because sometimes our instructors tell us stuff that's not in our textbook or not in our, you know, our notes. So I'm like, okay, I gotta take those additional notes down and you ask questions. That's what it means to be involved and engaged during class. I see you all have notes in front of you and like our star student back there, Susie, is taking such wonderful notes, right? So she's being engaged. And so that's important to be engaged during the class lecture. And then the third part is, this is the hardest part that, I, that students kind of um, really have to work on is that within 24 hours of that lecture, you have to review all that material. Within 24 hours. Not four days, not, not, not the day before the next class, but within 24 hours of that lecture, you need to review all that material. Our brain is a beautiful thing and it can do a lot, but in terms of memorization, it takes a lot of work. And in terms of retaining the information, it takes a lot of work. Does anybody know how many times the brain needs to see something before it can remember it? No? Seven times on average, seven times. So if we look at this three-step process that Harvard figured out, right? It's that one, we read it. Two, we take notes on it. That's twice our brain sees that information. Then during class, we take additional notes. We're listening to the class lecture and we're asking questions. That's three more times our brain is processing that information. Lastly, we reread and review our materials within 24 hours. There's the seven times our brain gets to see that material so that we can now retain it. That's why this process works. It does take some time to create this habit, but if you can do it, that's a big piece of being successful in understanding the reading and writing part, the studying habit part of college, okay? There are things that can help you though. You don't have to do this alone. One, 
There are online apps that help you read the textbook and other materials, right? Some of us say, well, I'm a slow reader. So if I read everything and I read it three times, it's going to take me a year. Well, if you need a little help on the reading and there are text uh, apps that help you read to you, right? And so that helps. There are tutoring services in, you know, on Columbia's campus that they can help you with reading and writing skills. There's the TRIO Center and there's, um, you know, the students, services for students with disabilities that Columbia College offers to their students that also help you to figure all this stuff out. And there's so many online videos that teach you how to take different types of notes, like web notes, listing notes, and of course, the number one type of note taking is Cornell Method which again is a little bit time consuming, but it is known to be the best type of note taking. There are also other things. Find a good study buddy, you know, a friend who's going to motivate you like we've got this math class, let's just study together. Use a daily or weekly calendar, which I'm going to talk about in the time management section, right? But you have to have organized times that you say, I'm going to do my digital media class on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and I'm going to study both of those days. I'm going to do my screenwriting class on Mondays and Thursdays and study for two hours each of those days, right? You're going to have to create something like that. And last but not least, time management and procrastination, which are things that I talk to students about all day every day. So for time management, I want you to consider your hourly load every week, All right? What that means is Columbia College is on a 15 week semester, right? How many credits are you taking within that 15 week semester? For every credit, there's approximately one hour of instruction per week. So if I'm taking a three credit class, my class is gonna be about three hours a week, just for the class alone. Additionally, for every credit, you're gonna have approximately one to two hours of additional homework and studying time related to that class. So I am no math wizard. I have a lot of degrees, but none of them are in math. But if I did my math right, for 12 credits, which is considered full time, you are going to have approximately 24 to 36 hours of work between going to class and doing the lectures, all the studying, all the homework, all the reading, all the additional requirements for that class. 24 to 36 hours of work a week. Where are you going to build in that time? That's what time management is all about. There are daily and weekly planners that you can find on the internet, like I found this one. It has like 45 minute increments with like a 15 minute break increment in between Sunday through Saturday, you know, and you build in when you need to do your, your, your major to do's and other things that you have going on in your life. These are two I created. So one is an Excel spreadsheet. So those of you that like Excel, you might want to do it on an Excel spreadsheet. Goes from early in the morning to late at night, Monday through Sunday, and you just type in everything you need to do for the week. And, um, and this is in a half hour increments. I like half hour increments personally. And then I also have one on Microsoft Word that I call a daily time log, so you can also create it on a Word document. And again, they're in half hour increments from early in the morning to late at night, right? It's time consuming to set it up, but it is a lifesaver when you know that you're using every minute of your day appropriately. And you're even building in that self-care time, that free time too, because we need that. I don't want you working from 6 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. without building in any time for yourself. But you do need to know when you're using your time appropriately and making sure that you're building in the time you need to do the proper studying for school, which is your ultimate goal and priority. And I 
think one of our college students' favorite topics, which is about procrastination. And um, really, it's not just a student thing. Adults who aren't in school procrastinate. <laughs> Children procrastinate on maybe doing their chores at home or whatever the case may be. It's part of our human behavior. We know that it's um, you know scientifically based. There, it's been built into us. Um, the ancient Greeks came up with a word for procrastination. So it's been in our history since time immemorial. It's a part of us, right? So we can't um, necessarily get rid of it, but we can learn how to do better at it, okay? So there's something that was created um, called the Procrastination Action Line. And um, the X and Y axis has the ideas of pain and time on them, right? So when we start to procrastinate on something, our body actually feels physical pain. We don't like it. It makes us worried, anxious, nervous. We start to feel ill. We try to do everything in our power to do other things to kind of block what we're actually feeling about the task we really need to do. But our body never forgets that, right? So we actually feel it in our body, this pain when we're procrastinating on a really important task. So what happens is that as that pain increases, it gets us closer and closer to the action line, which means we're finally going to do the task we needed to do. Once we finally get there, notice how the pain goes down because we no longer need that pain because we're doing the task. So the procrastination action line teaches us that if we want to stop procrastinating, we have to move the pain closer to point A. We can't wait till it gets all the way to point B. We have to move it to point A. So how can we give ourselves pain earlier on? So one way to do that is to figure out things that you really hate, that really cause you pain, and hold yourself accountable. Either I do the task that I'm supposed to do at the time I'm supposed to do it, or I do this other thing that I really hate. There are actual online programs that help with procrastination. And one of them, you pay money and the organization takes your money and it says, okay, what's your goal with this money? I have a paper due and I wanna start doing it on this date and I wanna make sure I have it done by this date. Great. All throughout, it tracks what you're doing. And if you don't do it, they take your money and they give it to an organization you hate. That's what it means to move the pain line earlier. Right? Some people, it's like doing chores around the house they hate. So like, okay, if you don't get it done, you have to do the chores and clean your house. Oh my God, I'd rather just write the paper than write the paper. Right? So how are you going to move your pain line up? All right, so you're walking away with a whole bunch of information. But to end, I'm going to try to summarize it with the three R's. That's what I call the three R's involved in moving from stagnation to success in college. The first R is remember you're not alone. I talked about this in self-advocacy. I talked about this in communication, how important it is to open your mouth and ask for what you need. That's what it means that you're not alone because there are people who will respond to you. There are people who are going to help you, right? There are people um, in all departments that are there to make sure you feel like you're welcome, like you belong, and that we're here to support you. So remember, you are not alone, even if it feels that way sometimes. The second R is reach out and ask for what you need. That was the whole point of the communication part of this presentation. You have to ask for what you need. Know what you need and then communicate it to the right people, right? And then three, relish your time in college. I think I've been in college for over 20 years because how much I love education, how much I feel that it's made a huge difference in my life, in the life of my children, in the life of the next generation that I'm trying to improve and support, right? 
And it's be been because of education, and I want you all to enjoy it because the time, you may not spend 20 years in college like me. You may have your first degree and then be ready and go off into your career, right? And so this time may be short. Know that it's a beautiful time in your life. Know that this journey will impact you for the rest of your life. Enjoy it. Enjoy everything that it has to offer and make sure you balance that with the work that you need to do in order to accomplish this goal. Thank you all and I hope you enjoyed the presentation and reach out if you need anything.